So we come to the Tuesday of Holy Week, two days after Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And he follows this up by clearing, cleansing the temple of misuse by the, the sellers and thoroughly cheesing off the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the chief rabbis and other Jewish religious authorities. And this has been building up for some time. And these leaders, as we see in scripture, are out to get him killed. Yet Jesus, knowing what his fate uh, uh, was to be later in the week, is in a bullish mood. He's not meek, he's not mild, and he doesn't hold back, even though he knows that they're out to get him and he will later that week be put to death. We're looking at Luke chapter 20 today, and on that Tuesday in the temple where he's teaching, he aims a very pointed message by telling a story, a parable. So please take a few moments to read from chapter 20 of Luke, verses 9 to 19. Now, the underlying message of this parable would have been very clear and fully understood by the crowd and the leaders, aimed primarily at those religious authorities, and that would have incensed them even more. If we think of this as a parable, as a playlet, then who are the players and what's the setting? Well, referencing uh, Hebrew scripture, the Jewish crowd would have known that the vineyard referred to Israel, God's chosen people. And like today, it will have been created to bear fruit with careful management and good stewardship. The owner rents out the vineyard to tenants, the stewards, managers, farmers to tend and to be fruitful in its harvest in return for a rent and a part of the harvest of what actually isn't the tenant's own. The owner, of course, is God. The tenants are the religious authorities, the chief priests and so on, who profess to know and love the creator God. Things as we can read in scripture don't go according to plan. The tenant managers don't fulfill their responsibilities. So the owner sends servants three times at harvest, I suspect to warn and to collect the fruit. And each time, each one of the three servants is beaten up and sent packing back. The servants, of course, represent God's prophets who God sent to warn the people and to point them in the right direction, the Isaiahs, the Elijahs. Worse still, the tenants now start to believe that the vineyard, vineyard is their own and that they can do as they wish and handle in, in their way. So the owner sends his only son to sort the mess, a respected person. But the tenants know in their society, possession is nine tenths of the law. And if an owner has no heir, the property can be claimed by whoever. So the tenants decide to kill the son when he comes to them and to take ownership of what is not theirs. The son, of course, is Jesus. It's interesting that Jesus is very much in this story announcing him to be God's son and Messiah, something he's avoided previously. And the crowd would know this. Verse 13, those words, my son whom I love is of course what God said over him at Jesus' baptism. At this point, the temple crowd will take on board the message and the leaders especially. Rejection will bring judgment. Jesus continues the parable. 
He looks at the temple crowd directly, eyeball to eyeball. Was he now applying this message to all of them, not just the leaders? Does this message apply to all of us? Those who profess to be God Jesus followers. Let's just read those last few verses of the parable from verse 15. What will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, may this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked then, what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law at this point and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. What's playing out here it is so rich in what it says about creation, how our creator God wants us to share and be blessed in that creation in return for its good stewardship. We're entrust, entrusted the world yard, not just the vineyard, but the world yard, and are accountable for it. And God wants to share that with us as co-heirs with Jesus. Unfortunately, the world yard, as we treat it, is full of me, 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 mine, mine, mine. And we overlook and ignore Jesus. In these last few verses of the parable, Jesus is now referencing again Hebrew scripture, talking about the capstone, which the crowd would immediately recognise as meaning Jesus. Psalm 118, verse 22. A great builder always searches out from the quarry the most perfect stone to start with and also to finish the structure with a perfect capstone. Clearly this is missed and an imperfect structure is developed. Jesus is the perfect capstone but in so many ways missed, overlooked, reject, rejected. Now Easter of course is only a few days away and Easter is synonymous with eggs and new life. Now imagine I have a large stone here and if I drop an egg on it, what happens? It of course breaks. And what if I drop the stone on the egg? It gets crushed. The stone always wins. And my take on this is that the capstone Jesus always wins. God will have righteous judgment on those who reject Jesus and God from enjoying this earthly life. But God wants to bless us through to eternity. He guarantees the final triumph of Easter Day through the, not just the death of Jesus, but Jesus' resurrection, who is living today. And it's our acceptance of the living Jesus that will bless us with eternal life, to be co-heirs with Jesus of all that God wants for us. So in summary, God has infinite patience and love for us, as we've seen as he persisted in sending servants to the tenants. He knows the rubbish, he knows the wrongs that separate from us, that is sin. But his love is so immense that he sends his only son, knowing it will be to his son's death, to account for all those wrongs and sins. But the greatest thing is this, that Jesus is alive and is with God, and we are promised that we, by following him in his fullness, will inherit and be given that ultimate blessing as co-heirs as well. Amen.